Hi, and welcome to Atasca Waters. This is the first in a series of programs we will be airing on ICTV, all on the general subject of shorelands in Atasca County. I'm your host, Brian Whittemore. This program is made possible by the nonprofit organization Atasca Waters and by the financial support of the Blandon Foundation. My guest today is Dave Lick, a founding member and current president of Atasca Water Legacy Partnership, now known as Atasca Waters. Dave is a longtime resident of the Grand Rapids area and owner of Atasca Reliable Insurance until his retirement a few years ago. Dave and his wife Sue are very active in many local things, but Dave is perhaps most prominent for his advocacy for clean water. So Dave, thanks for being here with us today. Thanks for inviting me, Brian. Thanks for doing this. Let's start out on kind of the general overlook of Atasca Waters and then we'll move into more specific areas. But um, we described it as a local nonprofit, which Atasca Waters is. Does it work in just in Atasca County? And how would you describe Atasca Waters and its work? Well, first of all, Brian, I would concur with you that we pretty much only work in Itasca County. Um, many of our board members don't live in Itasca County. When I say many, we have 15, but numerous people do not live in the confines of Itasca County but realize the importance of maintaining a water resource that has still not degraded. Um, we happen to live in an area where the water quality has remained pretty status quo, but it's extremely important that residents are aware of how fragile the resource is and what they can do to make sure that it doesn't degrade. Compared to other parts of Minnesota, how would you compare Itasca County with Minnesota River counties, et cetera, other parts of Minnesota? Okay, well, I did not grow up here. I grew up in southern Minnesota in Sibley County, which is an agricultural county. My father was an FFA teacher, and we have many lakes in southern Minnesota, as most the listeners will know. Um, the problem is, is that those lakes have now become unswimmable, and it didn't just take one year for that to happen. It's happened over a number of years. When I was a youngster growing up, the local lake was eutrophic at the time, but it still wasn't pea soup. And last spring when I was down there, I took a, lot, a walk along it, and it's almost to the point where it's, it's noxious to your nose. So with that said, when I moved here in 1977 or 78, um, I realized quite quickly that I was going to be living, hopefully, in a place where the water quality was um, pristine 35, 40 years ago, and yet at the same time usable by a lot of people, and uh, has always been a tourist attraction. My attitude about water in southern Minnesota, Brian, has become that uh, it's pretty much unusable south of St. Cloud. Um, people still go out on the water, but there's no longer a time where they'll see their toes in many of the lakes. There are a few of them have, who have been, that have been very well protected, but yet at the same time, development is the key issue here and how people um, use best management practices when they're living on a water basin. So would you say the problem in other parts of Minnesota, as you just described, are um, you read about agricultural runoff, is that the only thing to blame? Is that the main thing to blame? Well, you know, like my dad used to say, who was an FFA teacher, Dave, we got to feed the world. But the fact of the matter is, is that now when you look at the test wells in central and south Minnesota, you will quickly see that 40% of those test wells, which are in the aquifers, are now contaminated with nitrogen. Well, something's gone amiss. I mean, either the science is a bit off or they're using too much. 
I mean, I'm not suggesting that we discontinue agriculture. I'm just thinking that there's ways of doing this um, so that you protect the resources, like for instance, buffers. The last few years in Minnesota, um, Governor Dayton has been head over heels about buffers along drainage ditches. And those buffers are strictly set up to take out the nutrient before it hits the water body. So what I'm thinking is in Itasca County, we need to be proactive up here. So your first question revolved around, are we working in Itasca County? Yeah, I think we got our hands full trying to handle what's, what, what here there is to do. I think it's an educational thing. And personally, I've ran into very few people who don't um, covet and don't appreciate clean, fresh water. The problem is, is that many times they're not exactly sure how to take care of it, Brian. So in walks Itasca Waters. Yep. And um, let's talk about the background of Itasca Waters just a little bit. It just doesn't, it didn't come into being back in, I think, 2006. You and a few other people from here decided to do something about what? Well, what, what, what started the whole ball rolling is I was in charge of the Itasca Coalition of Lake Associations, which is a, a, <clears throat> a great organization in Itasca County that encompasses any organized lake associations that want to meet on a monthly basis. And at that time, what we were finding is that we needed to maybe go a step deeper into trying to um, conserve water and also to get the educational message out there. So we gathered, six of us gathered around my kitchen table and we put together an idea. And the idea was that currently we only had about 50 to 70 lakes that had baseline chemistry data on what was in that water, Brian. And so what we did, first of all, our first um, endeavor was to try to support and finance a freshwater laboratory here in Itasca County so that we could gather samples of water from the county's lakes and find out what the chemical analysis, primarily phosphorus, nitrogen, and chlorophyll, along with dissolved oxygen and a few other parameters. And what ended up happening is after we got these six people moving, we um, yeah, it, it was it was fast moving. We got Itasca Community College involved immediately, and they were interested in housing a laboratory there. And we were able to find some dollars to finance through the county. They provided money for the equipment for the laboratory, and then we hired students at ICC to gather those samples. By the time we were done over a three-year period, we now have about three hundred. Um, lakes in Itasca County rather than the 70 original that now have um, certified data on them on what those baseline numbers looked like for phosphorus and nitrogen. But keep in mind, you know, it's a dynamic system. The systems are always changing, but at least now if there's discussion about, you know, the trophic status of a water body, we at least have some numbers that we can say that we found in like 2009 or 2010 or 2011 when we were doing that sampling. We also employed, you know, 10 students throughout the summertime to do those jobs. Great jobs. I would have loved doing them as an adolescent kid. So. The waters in Itasca County, would you call them pristine? Are they troubled? I mean, what's the level of our waters here? Itasca Waters over the last couple of years has gotten involved with some trend studies that RMB Labs does for us. RMB Labs has now taken over the laboratory out at ICC for us. Um, what I would like to say about that is this. I would wager to say that the trends in trophic status of the lakes are definitely changing. Some of them are literally improving. Some of them are staying the same, and some of them are not quite as good as they were 30 or 40 years ago. If you ask people who live on a lake like Pokegama, many of those people will say, hey, you know, I don't think the water quality is like it used to be. I think there's more vegetation growing. Well, there's a good reason for that, and that has to do with nutrient loading. So. When you ask me if Itasca County lakes are pristine, I mean, 
when I think of pristine water, I'm probably going to think of something like Lake Baikal, which is almost on the Arctic Circle. But these lakes are used heavily, and I like to call them sometimes love to death, Brian. I mean, we as Minnesotans and, you know, upper Midwest people certainly understand the tranquility and the serenity of clean water and going to the lake. And if we put in the right situations now, I think we have a good chance of maintaining and sustaining that good water quality. I don't necessarily want to say pristine, but that water quality for the next hundred years. And that involves getting the forestry community involved so that we have major, major root systems to take out these nutrients that are used on the land. Anything put on the land ultimately ends up in the water basin. We got six watersheds in this county and certainly it's enough to keep us busy as a water advocacy group. Well, I've read, Dave, that in southern Minnesota, again by comparison, um, that those waters are unrecoverable as far as turning them back into good, healthy lakes, at least with current science and technologies. On the other hand, I've also heard uh, in some of the Itasca Waters meetings that lakes here in Itasca County are not at all beyond recovery, that they're good, as you described, Dave, but they can get better and in some cases are. Would you agree with that, that the efforts are worth it here because we can recover the water or keep it good? Yeah, I think, Brian, when you look at water as an ecological niche, any kind of ecological niche always has the possibility of rebounding. It can clean itself. If there were no humans left on those southern Minnesota lakes and no agriculture, over time those lakes would repair themselves. But everyone that's going to be listening to this program understands that to try to generate money and to raise money to try to clean those lakes now is literally impossible to do. We're struggling in this state maintaining our roads and our infrastructure for carrying fresh water to people's houses, for goodness sakes. How in the world are we supposed to try to clean up lakes? So that's the whole idea about Itasca Waters. What we want to try to do is prevent that from happening. And that can be done by the people that live in the watershed. I mean, they can still have houses, they can still have beaches, but that those kinds of things have to be done in a best management practice way to maintain the sustainability of that nice, wonderful, recreational, swimmable lake. So the mission statement, basically the logo for Tasca Waters is team up for clean waters. That's been around as long as the organization has been around. So how would you define team up for clean waters? Well, I think the last thing people need to have is somebody giving them a sermon on how they need to handle their own residence if they're living on a lake or for that matter if they're living out of the riparian area. I mean most people really don't like being bossed around Brian is the way I feel about it. But the fact of the matter is is I've only run into one person in all of these years of doing this water stuff that said, oh, Lick, you're wasting your time. Who really cares if the water's polluted? People are still going to use it. When somebody says water's polluted, that means a whole lot of different things. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's just green pea soup algae. That could mean that it's got a chemical pollution to it. But the idea behind Team Up for Clean Waters is there's no way that this organization can advocate and do anything unless we're able to form teams and work collaborative with, collaboratively with other people and other organizations. And over the years, that's worked pretty well with this organization. We always look for someone to partner with, whether it be the Itasca Community College, or whether it be a septic system pumper, or whether it be a group of people who are interested, we're working on some water advisors right now as we speak. And I want to ask you more about that. Okay, well, go ahead. I think I've answered your question about the, about the mantra. So Itasca Waters has had good fortune in, in having good partners, and that continues to grow, I know. Um, let me talk a little bit further about that, and then we'll get into some of the specific areas and talk about our website and sure. Shoreland Guide. Um, 
Atasca Waters has had a successful history of funding, it seems, right from the beginning. Um, and to be transport, uh, transparent, I'm on the board of Atasca Waters as well, and, and we're um, um, sponsoring this, this program. Mm -hmm. So I'm familiar with some of this, but I've only been around for about two and a half years. So my understanding is that the group uh, has had a, a really successful history of funding, especially from Blandon, but from a bunch of other organizations as well. Uh, and recently, we've had a grant from the Bush Foundation, which is a privileged and rare grant to get. Mm -hmm. And we, we got that, uh, primarily mm -hmm. through your work. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like to have you, Dave, comment on that a little bit and what that money is used for over the years. <clears throat> and then we can get into Shoreland Advisors, which Bush will be used for? Well, I think if you talk to anybody who runs any kind of organization, the whole key revolves around dollars. And so when you want to try to do something, either you have to raise the money or you have to find someone who's willing to sponsor it and come up with the money, which is still raising the money. And in addition to those kinds of things, we happen to be blessed with a, with a foundation in Grand Rapids that's I don't know, I like to call them Grandpa Blandon, you know. But what they've done over the years for this organization is given it its, its, its wheels. Um, they were with us um, about seven or eight years ago when we first went to see them about getting some things going with this water testing. They understand that um, water in this county is an economic driver, I like to call it the golden goose of this county. I mean approximately 80 million dollars comes in through tourism dollars and I don't think they're necessarily coming here to go to the movies or going out to eat or shopping at Target. I think they're coming here because we got water. And my attitude has always been that if you preserve, conserve, and take good care of that resource we're gonna have people coming here spending dollars for a long time to come. It's a great community. There's, there's a fi the, the philanthropic attitude, might I say, of people in this community and in this county is, I think, somewhat unsurpassed. But I guess I haven't lived anywhere for the last 35 years, so I'm not sure I really under get all of that. But I like to brag about this community and what they've been able to accomplish. Not many towns of this size have a performing arts building, a YMCA, you know, a new hospital. I mean, there's reasons for those kinds of things. So that goes hand in hand with protecting this water resource, Brian. So the Bush Foundation, first of all, Blannon gave us some money about eight or nine years ago, and then we went to them again a, few, uh, a year and a half ago and told them that we were now going to give up the aquatic invasive species program that we started and we were going to give that to the Itasca County Soil and Water Department, which is a perfect fit at this point in time for it. So at that time, we went out to the community and we asked the community what they thought we should take on next as a water advocacy idea. And resoundingly, it came to shoreland, Brian. And those sho that shoreland um, endeavor encompasses five basic areas. It encompasses buffers, it encompasses septic systems, it encompasses the littoral zone, the area out in front of the person's land in that's the in the water, okay? It involves erosion, and it also involves forestry. I mean, this county, when I look at this county, I look at forestry and I look at water and I think they're twins. I mean, they both function off each other. If there's clean water, there's good forest. If there's good forest, there's clean water. So I mean, that whole idea had to be brought to the attention of the people who are going to provide some kind of financial impetus to Itasca Waters. And once we thought through that and they looked at what we had done with the last grant, they thought that we were probably right on the shoreland thing. Now bear in mind, not once have we thought that taking on shoreland is going to be an easy job, Brian. It's going to be kind of steady by jerks. People love lawns, but the fact of the matter is lawns and lakes don't cohabitate well. 
There's no root structure to take out any nutrient that's coming off that lawn or from that house that the person lives with. But natural vegetation has huge root systems that filter that nitrogen, take it up, make biomass, provide biodiversity so that all of the other critters can live around that lake. There's no reason in the world why people who live in this county can't still have some lawn, can't still have some beach, but for goodness sakes, camouflage most of that beach with natural vegetation, and that's what this shoreland program is going to do. So with that said, we got some money from Blandon last year, and it just so happened that we were talking with the Bush Foundation, and what came up with the Bush Foundation, I was explaining to them what we were gonna try to do with the shoreland, and we published this guide. Um, Brian's wife is the person who really put all the time and effort into this, but we got this published. And then Brian's got it on our website. So now what the, what the dilemma is, Itasca County residents, is trying to get people to go to that website or go to this shoreland guide, read it, and do it. So what the, what the idea of the Bush money is going to be is it's going to provide some financial capabilities to try to engage, educate, and bring Itasca County residents either to the guide or to the website to see exactly what the recipe is for maintaining good water into the future. A reminder, we're talking with Dave Lick, who's the president of Itasca Waters, which is a local uh, clean water ad ad advocacy group. That word should be easier to say, by the way. Um, talking about the website, the, the uh, address is itascawaters.org, really simple. And in that website, uh, it's structured so that somebody who wants to inquire about their aquatic zone, their littoral zone, the water part, the shoreline, the embankment, septic, septic or private forest management can find a wealth of resources. It's easy to navigate. A lot of questions are answered. It's being consistently updated. Um, so it's uh, that and this are both really incredible resources for learning how to do the work and how to participate in having a healthier lake or river where you live. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to get people to go there and do a little bit of homework and just figure out how best they can structure their shoreland to make it more ecologically fit, if I might say. And again, you know, we're not asking people to go to the extreme end and never have a beach. I mean, everybody likes to be able to walk down to a beach, but I'm not sure we need a hundred foot beach. I mean, the, 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 it's less work to let some of it grow. If you literally let some of the dogwood and some of that stuff come back, if you quit mowing, some of that stuff is gonna immediately come back because that's the natural way that that beach originally was. It's good stuff. It's good back. stuff, yeah. And the people might say, well, yeah, I lose my sight line. Well, then plant some trees and um, cut off the boughs as the tree grows so that you don't lose your sight line. But that root system is a miracle worker for taking up the phosphorus and the, the nitrogen. Keep in mind, listeners, one pound, one pound of phosphorus makes 500 pounds of blue-green algae. So it's a huge, huge deal. So that, those, those elements, if I might say, those nutrients are limiting factors on that water quality. The more phosphorus that you have in the water, the greener that lake is gonna get, and that, of course, takes away the oxygen that the aquatic invertebrates and the, fishing, the fish need to survive. So it, it reduces the amount of oxygen in the water, which everybody understands is conducive to maintaining life. So Dave, you're, you're um, not you, but a person owns a cabin on a lake, maybe they're a full-time resident here, it's a full-time house, like the two of us, maybe it's a, a second home, mm -hmm. people from the cities are coming up and they're watching this program perhaps on, on YouTube or on our website, mm -hmm. uh, where it is, and they're curious about what they can do to have a healthier lake. They're good people, you know, most of us are, mm -hmm. wanting to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So you've got your five zones we just 
talked about, from the water all the way up to, say, the bluff where the, mm -hmm. they might be lucky enough to have a, a, a forest there and they might want to manage it. And then you've got this concept that we were talking about called shoreland advisors, which I'm pretty sure you kind of came up with <laughs> uh, in a magic moment. And, yeah, well. and now there's a group of you working on it. Um, you've employed a professional to help. Could you talk about, well, let me talk, let me describe it a little bit sure, as I understand it, and then you can uh, yeah. cross the T's and dot the I's. Yep. So what you're looking at is finding some people around Grand Rapids in Itasca County yep. who aren't necessarily learned about these things. Right. But they're interested in doing the right thing. So we're entertaining them, buying them a, a burger and a beer and talking to them. Yep. And getting them to volunteer, at least some of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, to go to people's houses upon request mm -hmm. and not browbeat them or anything, just saying, yeah, mm -hmm. here's some of the things you can do and here's a mm -hmm. shoreland guide that you mm -hmm. can look through and mm -hmm. here's some septic um, information companies or some information. Am I getting it right? Is that yeah. the basic yeah. concept? Yeah. I think, I think to add to that, Brian, I think the concept is exactly right. I think what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get people who look at our website and see the names of some of the other people who are willing to help out thinking that you know the way that you try to change behaviors is try to get people to rather than tell them what to do you know just provide the information and let them do it themselves so the idea behind the shoreland advisors is you know, we're, we're really not looking for the experts in the business, the biologist who knows every genus and species of every natural plant, but we want a whole diverse group of people. Like, I would love to have some builders, some plumbers, some bankers, some insurance agents. I don't have any problem with having somebody be a shoreland advisor that has a grass lawn down to their lake. Because I firmly believe that after they read this book and they talk to a few people, they're going to realize that the best thing to do to cut down the no a number of hours that they spend mowing the lawn and doing whatever else they have to do is to let some of that shoreland grow. And I think some of those people are some of the best advisors we could have as long as they understand what's in the covers of that shoreland guide. So with that said, we have had two meetings so far. We started in December and we asked you know, 15 people to come to a meeting, and we visited about this. And what we're having is we're having some success with the local residents of the county raising their hand and saying, hey, look, you know, that's a worthwhile program. I'll do that. So now we have to figure out how we're going to train them. We have the University of Minnesota Extension. Karen Terry is going to be doing the training. From so, Morris. Uh, from Moore, from the, yes, yeah. from, well, she's from Fergus Falls, but she's from the University of Minnesota Morris. But anyway, she's going to do the training, and, you know, everybody has a different level of confidence with this advisor program. There's some people who do know the genus and species of all these uh, plants and whatever else that happened. They understand how a septic system functions, but not everybody does that. So we're going to have to sort of specially do the education thing and maybe offer different levels of education to different people. So we'd also like to have some demo sites. If somebody has recently had their shoreland redone, maybe there's been programs through the Soil and Water Conservation Service for years. Itasca Coalition of Lake Associations does a thing every year where they recognize people who have updated their shoreland to make it more ecologically friendly. I mean, if we have people out there that are listening, please get a hold of our website and let us know that you're willing to let us use your place to show people. I mean, those are the ways that I think is best to try to do this. Not a forced deal. It's one of those deals where you try to, you try to, you, you try to lead them to the water and let them do their own thing, so, so to speak. Yeah. So it's a people-to-people -people program. It has nothing to do with enforcement, with government, with power, any of those things. It's people to people. It's people to people. And I, I, I can tell you folks that if, here's what I recently found out from a person who's a forester. He made the statement to me that they, a group of foresters and a group of water ecologists met in the last four or five years, and they're starting to look at the Northland is the last bastion of this water that's not irreparable right now. It's in still good shape. 
So what they're advocating is they're advocating that if you look at each watershed, 75% of that watershed needs to be maintained in forest of some sort. That does not mean that you can't log. That only means that you're not going to develop that area and make it impervious surface so that the water can't percolate through the ground and be taken up by the root systems of these forests. So in these trend reports that I originally mentioned, what we've had the trending company do is look at the watersheds to find out what the percentage of forestation is. And what we're seeing is not all good news. Some of them, of these, of these lakes, have 75% forested uh, land around them, but some of them now are starting to go downhill. Some of them are heading into the 60s. If you look at southern Minnesota, southern Minnesota used to be a forested area and it also had prairie grass. And that was the filtering system for all this wonderful water. It's all gone now and that the water quality is also all gone. Well, Dave, we're out of time, believe it or not. So. Really? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Dave Lick, the president of Atasca Waters, a extremely worthwhile organization. Um, so congratulations on all the good work and much luck in doing a lot of better work, even even better work in the future. So if you would like more information about uh, Itasca County shorelands and how to keep your shoreland healthy and maintain or grow your property's value, please go to our website, itascawaters.org. The site has tons of useful links to all kinds of resources, simple to navigate. Our next program will deal with the aquatic zone, the first several feet of water adjacent to your shoreline. So check ICTV listings for when that program will air. Thanks very much for watching Itasca Waters. I'm your host, Brian Whitmore.